Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. My name is Thomas Wall uh, from Microsoft Research here in Redmond, um, and it's my pleasure uh, to introduce to you a uh, session on uh, code contracts and PECs, uh, first presented by uh, Mike Barnett and Mpele Dehelu. Um, they're gonna tell you about some tools here from um, Microsoft for uh, specifying how code works and for testing that the code does what uh, the specification says. And then um, after they uh, give their talk and demo, uh, Christopher Ch Christoph Solner, uh, Chalner, I should say, uh, from the University of Texas at Arlington, there he is coming in. Uh, he'll give you uh, more details on the technique of uh, some of the algorithms underlying this uh, 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 tools that uh, Mike and uh, Pele are gonna present you. Okay, gentlemen, take it away. Hello, Mike. Great, hey, Pele, thanks. Thanks everybody for coming on this uh, beautiful summer Seattle day, which uh, I hope it uh, actually turns into fall soon because it's usually warmer in the fall than it is in the summer. But what we want to talk to you about today is uh, the work we've been doing in Microsoft Research uh, and with our affiliated research people, like Christoph, on uh, tools that deal with .NET code, and in particular, being able to do analysis and instrumentation for doing runtime analysis and static analysis. OK. so. Uh, Code Contracts is a design by contract system for .NET. Uh, and I'll tell you a lot more about design by contract and the details about code contracts. But the main thing you need to remember is that it's a library that allows you to express method preconditions and postconditions. And PEX is a, is a test generation tool. It, uh, it applies a technique called dynamic symbolic execution. So it impl implements this for .NET. Uh, we surface specs to the user uh, under the form of parameterized unit testing. So users write uh, unit tests with parameters and we generate interesting inputs to, uh, to test the code. And we'll see that in the demos. So the kind of tools that we've built on top of code contracts um, to show you the kinds of things that can be done with a design by contract system include the documentation generation, uh, including hopefully if it works, the IDE integration. Uh, which is the uh, uh, development environment so that programmers are aware of contracts and it helps them as they write their code. And we also have tools that do runtime checking and static checking. And on the PEC side, you'll see how we can uh, execute code uh, and then analyze it and then generate inputs. And also how we can leverage the contracts annotation to, to go and hunt for bugs. In addition to just the tools, we don't want you to walk away just thinking that the only thing, you know, you can either use our tools or not use our tools. What we really want to drive home is that we're, we've created some infrastructure that we would like to make available to you so that you can use it, uh, and for, in particular in the code contracts uh, setting, you can use the in, uh, infrastructure as an open source platform to do any kind of bytecode analysis uh, for .NET. And on the PEG side, we've built a uh a framework to do runtime analysis, and Christoph will will talk a little bit about uh, research that we've done together, where he's, he's leveraged that infrastructure to do some some pretty cool work. And what we'd like to get from you is an idea of whether or not you feel that this infrastructure would be useful to you, both for your teaching and for your research. So we're going to throw out some examples during the talk of things we think that one could do for both of those topics, and we're hoping that you'll. Uh, give us your feedback. And I should say now, if you have any questions, please don't wait till the end. Go ahead and jump in, and uh, there's somebody with a microphone who will come running around to uh, amplify you. Great. So I just wanted to say a few words about the history of the Code Contracts project. Design by contract is a very old idea, and it's the idea that specifications can be used to uh, enrich APIs, application programming interfaces, with more than just what they currently consist of, which is the type information. So today, when you program against a, a, a component, you know that a method has a certain name, and you know it takes so many parameters, and you know the types of those parameters. But uh, design by contract is a way to say that you should know more. You should be able to get much more information about what it is that you're, uh, how you're interacting with a, a component. 
And Eiffel was probably the, the preeminent language, the first language that really decided to integrate contracts as a first class citizen uh, so that a method contract is, is just part of that method signature, uh, which was a huge advance in, in bringing the consciousness of contracts and specifications to programmers. Uh, at this, around the same time, ESC Modula 3 was a system that applied uh, advanced verification in a way that you could think of as just a very smart compiler. That as the, just as you expect to get immediate feedback from your compiler that tells you about things you're doing wrong, the same thing should be true of verification errors. Uh, you may have also seen JML. Uh, some people think that this started before our efforts uh, in the same way they think Java started before .NET. Uh, and in both cases, they'd be right. And JML is an annotation-based system that lets you write specifications for methods in Java. In the research group, we tried to do an earlier attempt at, uh, at following these lines of thought. And we created a language called Spec Sharp, which was meant to also give first class support to contracts in the language and to give the kind of quick static checking that the ESC tools did. Uh, and it fell a little short in terms of revolutionizing the world of programming. It seems that most programmers still don't use Spec Sharp. Uh, and the difficulty is trying to get a new language in place. It's very, very difficult to, rep to uh, get people to try a new language. It's even more difficult to make sure that that language tracks the evolution in development environments and build systems and all the support tools that programmers are used to. So what we've decided on is to create a language agnostic framework. So we have a, you know, your two choices when you want to do language research is you either have a new language or you introduce a library. So Code Contracts is a way to have a library system. And that is particularly effective in the .NET world, because libraries in .NET are available to all .NET programmers. So there's many, many different .NET languages. And from any of those languages, you can write calls to the methods in the Code Contracts library. Uh, so that seems like enough talking. Maybe we should try to wake Switch them up a demos. bit by going to a demo. All right. So Mike, today what we're going to do is uh, is take a look at a little piece of code somebody wrote for us and, uh, and maybe improve it or maybe add some contracts to it. Yeah, let's see what the experience is like for uh, applying our tools to a daily programming task. So here we are in uh, Visual Studio 2010. This is, um, this is C Sharp and the parse line method is the one we're looking at. Uh, it, takes, it looks for key value pairs in, in an array of strings. And if, if one of the key is called foo, uh, whoops. If it's called foo, then it's going to return the value. And there might be some little issues there. And we might want to apply code contracts or pecs and see what's happening. OK. Well, nobody seems to think there's anything wrong with it, because nobody's shouting about all the errors in it. So I say we just run the thing and see if it works. Do you have OK, a so we've, uh, we have a main here. So we're going to pass the arguments of the, of the console to the, to the application. So I'm just going to go to my console app. I'm just going to do demo foo equals hello. Yeah, and everything well, seems to work, and maybe great. we don't have the right value, and then it, it doesn't know about parsing. But then if we do something like this, then it crashes. And then we get a nice error dialog, and yeah, things go downhill from here. So it seems like there are probably some issues in the code. It maybe doesn't work as perfectly as we would have hoped. All right. So here we are in Visual Studio, and how can we start? Uh, Working okay. with this program. Well, one of the tools that uh, I mentioned before for code contracts is the static checker. And the static checker is invoked once you go and install our tools. So our tools do not come in the box with Visual Studio, but there's a separate website uh, at Dev Labs that you can go to and download the tools. And once you install them on your machine, they'll be integrated into Visual Studio. And uh, if we just build the, uh, the project, then at the end of the build, the static checker is invoked. Just going to rebuild. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And we'll see if the static checker is happy with the code. Oh, and now we see the kinds of errors, right? So this is how we feel errors should be presented to programmers. You should see them as part of uh, the programming environment. And uh, in particular, let's see, it's complaining about um, uh, this call to substring there. So it's unhappy about what exactly? It's unhappy that. Uh, one of the precondition in substring is violated. So the length, which is the, the second argument, uh, is not positive. 
Wow, how did it even know that uh, substring has a contract? That's amazing. So if you notice, we've actually, in the code contracts project, we've created what we call reference assemblies, which are assemblies containing just the contracts for the code. And we've produced those reference assemblies for all the different framework. So substring is a method just in the base class library. Anybody who writes a .NET program calls these sorts of methods. And if you're using our tools, now you're aware that as you're programming that you can see what the contracts are that you're going to be held against. So I can use this, for example, to understand what, what index of that, because that's really what's creating this index value. All right. And now it's, it's pretty clear that uh, from the post condition, we see that the results, so the index, could be negative. Oh, and the code didn't cater for that. We didn't take care of that return value from index of. So that's probably the problem. All let's, right, let's, let's fix check that for that. First. Yeah. Uh, how, much, uh, do, uh, how much of the libraries did you produce contracts for? Great. The, the question was, how much of the base class library have we produced contracts for? So uh, we have a contract for pretty much all each framework assembly. Within each assembly, uh, the coverage is kind of spotty. We're, we're pretty good about the preconditions. We know most of the preconditions for all of the framework methods. Um, and then we've added post conditions sort of at the high value uh, um, classes and interfaces that are, are important, that people use the most often. It's been mostly user, user driven. People go into the forums and report missing contracts for APIs they use commonly and then this, those get added. So it's really on demand that. Uh... Great, yeah, good question. All right, so we want yeah, to, uh, that. we want to ignore the case where the index is negative. All right, so if, the, if, the, if it's not able to find an equal sign on the line, that character, then it's just going to skip it and go on to the next line. Now, that seems good. OK, let's, All right. let's go so and let's build, build this. Let's build again and see if the uh, static checker is happy. OK, so we've reduced the number of errors, so we've made progress. We're definitely improving the code through the feedback from the tools. Let's look at some of the other errors. So this one is saying that. Uh, we might be using a value lines, which could be null. Right? Maybe you already spotted that when you were looking at the code. So let's fix that. So now you've seen contracts on the framework methods, but now we can add our own contracts in response. So we really don't want anybody to call this method with an argument that's null. Um, there you go. I fixed it. Yeah, I'm not, hmm. Yeah, that's not such a great fix, right? First off, unless they have the source code, they can't even see the comment. And even if they see the comment, we can't really guarantee that they're going to obey the comment. So maybe we should do something a little better than that. I think maybe some code instead of a comment would All right. help out. Great. So this is the kind of defensive programming that programmers have done right, forever. I mean, you, you, you guard your code by doing runtime checks that make sure you're not going to see any problems. The issue with writing these kinds of runtime checks is that they're only good inside your code. They're not good at that interface boundary between your component and any clients of your component. It's the clients that need to be able to see these conditions so that they can avoid the error in the first place. Right? So when, they, when a client sees it, all they're going to see is the signature, and they really need to know that part of the signature is not just that that parameter should be of type an array of string, but it really should be a non-null array of strings. So maybe we could. Instead of doing the uh, uh, defensive programming, why don't we add our own contract? That's an excellent point. So how do we write contracts? You, right. you mentioned a library. Right. So there's a library in .NET now. So you mean that ships as part of the default .NET uh, download? That's right. So as of .NET 4.0, the contract library is in MS Corelib, meaning all you have to do is go out and get your copy of Visual Studio, and it's sitting there uh, for you to use. If you have an earlier version of Visual Studio, we have a small standalone library that you can reference that has the definitions of the contract methods. Uh, so in particular, we can create a call to uh, contract.requires, which lets us describe what condition needs to be true for a caller to, uh, to call this method. Maybe not. <laughs> and in particular, in this case, we'd like to say lines is not equal to null. All right. So that was one of the complaints. But then there were the other complaint was, not only does it need to know that the parameter itself is not null, but another complaint that the static checker notices is that each element of that array also must be not null. Right? And that's a much deeper contract. We're not just saying that you can't pass a null value, but that you have to pass an array of elements, and none of those elements are allowed to be null. Uh, 
so I'm going to just say that for all lines in uh, for all element in the array, yeah. um, following lambda should be true. So we're going to say that line shouldn't be null. Are people familiar with the way to write uh, lambda functions in .NET? Okay, if not, this is uh, just a little inline function, anonymous function. We don't need to give its name, and the C# -sharp compiler will create a method here that takes a string and returns a bool. And the parameter of that little method, its name is line. And then the thing to the right of the equal sign greater is the body of the method. That's the value of the result expression. Uh, so this is a good place to comment on. We often get the question, why did we create library methods? Why not use uh, other forms of annotation? And this sort of contract shows you that it's very difficult to come up with a standardized set of contracts that are a list of the only things you can say, right? So if you have some kind of, you know, fixed set of annotations, you cater for some set that you've designed, and then somebody always comes along and wants to say something different, something more involved. So maybe we want to say not only that um, each line is not null, but that each line has at least three characters, or each line starts with such and such a character. There's always the desire to extend and, and create more involved contracts. And by having any sort of expression in there, right, so you notice that the expressions passed to those two requires calls, it, it's any Boolean expression I can write. And in this case, in C sharp, because this is a C sharp program. If it was VB, that would be a VB expression. So the programmer doesn't have to learn any new language, and they can write expressions that are as involved as they want. Great. So we've touched on preconditions, and then what about postconditions? Yep. Oh, yeah, we should cover that. So we might want to say something about the string that comes back from this method, uh, and that's using a different method from the contract library, which is contract ensures. Ensures is a way to talk about the return value. Um, so now we want to say something about the return value. We want to say that the return value maybe is... Uh, uh, not empty. Not empty. Okay, so... There's a method in the uh, string class called uh, is null or empty, and we want to say that the thing we're going to return is not null or empty. And again, you can see the importance of having an open-ended language to be able to describe contracts. Here, I'm just able to use a method from the base class library itself as part of the contract. So now what I'd like to say is not null or empty is the thing that's being returned from this method. Mm. But there is no native way to say that in C-sharp. C-sharp has no vocabulary for talking about the return value of a method. So we encode that by yet another method call. We can talk about the result that comes back from the method. Oops. And in this case, we're returning a string. And so now this method call represents the value that comes back from the method. And it's up to all the tools that work on this form of contract to recognize that expression as, as referring to the method result. Um, So, so, Mike, one comment. Shouldn't you be writing the post condition at the, at the end of the method? Yeah, that's a good point. So notice that, as I've tried to indicate, we really want to think of this as the signature of this method is now, it's a method that takes a non-null array of strings, all of whose elements are not null, and it returns a string which is neither null nor empty. So it's really all part of his signature. So you have to think of these things, even though I'm writing them as method calls, and so they're code, you need to think of them as being declarative. I'm just making a statement about what should be true about this method. Whether there's any runtime behavior or not is a separate question, and our tools address that orthogonally and allow you to either decide to have the runtime behavior or not have the runtime behavior. Um, great. And so now if we build, let's see what happens now. So the static checker should be happy with the fact that lines is not null. Each element of the array is not null. Oh, it's unhappy about something. So it seems that we, it cannot prove the post condition we just added. Hmm. I don't know. The code looks pretty good to me. I think it should be able to prove that. So I now have feedback that the static checker was analyzing all possible execution sequences. And it says that there's some possible execution sequence where this thing would not be true when it comes time to return from the method. I wish I had a tool that could you know, actually show me an execution trace. Give me some real input values and run the code where it shows me that that fails. That's exactly where PEX is good at. So in fact, you can, you can right click in your method and, uh, and run PEX right there. So PEX is gonna 
generate inputs, trying to cover every branch in the program. And by doing so, it might actually trigger the branch that, throw, that violates the pass condition. Now, what you're going to see here is a table so that just popped up here. And this is an input-output table that represents different paths in the program. So you can see that we've mapped the lines array to this, to this column in the table, and then we've also mapped the return value to this other table. Uh, in the case where the program throws an exception, there's also a third table that, that shows the, the exception that was thrown. So we can see that the first test case that PEX tries is the null value. This is the simplest array you can create. And because we have this, this precondition that specifies that, well, we expect the lines not to be null, we actually filter this test case as an expected exception. This is, this is not really evaluation, we're just exploring the contracts. Now, when we drill down later in the, in the table, there is this line here that actually uh, also has a, a contract exception, but it's, uh, it's flagged as a violation. In fact, we can, we can read in the message that it's a post condition a violation. So that is actually, these are values that if we run our program with, we we'll actually hit the bug, right? In so fact, how did it actually come up with that exact value, FOO? How did it know to do that? So PEX does, uh, uh, applies what's called a dynamic symbolic execution, and Christoph will, will describe that in details. Uh, but it's a, it's a full program, it's a full trace analysis. We run the code, we build constraints, and then we constructively build new new values. For example, we can make the we can make things more fun here. Why don't we do something like a regular expression? So regex is the regular expression implementation in .NET, and we're going to match something that looks like maybe a, some email pattern, some letters dot com. Um, and now we can run again. So the message here, um, PEX doesn't throw values at random. It doesn't mine the method body for funny strings and tries them. It actually uh, constructs values based on how the program uses the value. And here you can see that now that we've changed the program, well, we need an, a different input that will, uh, that will go and violate the, the pass condition. So p at p.com actually um, regex's match is going to return true, and then we're going to go into this, this error mode. So what we can also do, because we have a value, is actually try it out and run it. So what I'm going to go is I'm going to go into the, the main, and instead of passing the arguments of the command prompt, I'm just going to hard code our little value here. So it was p, was it p at p.com. Now let's see if this builds, and let's try to step into the program. It's building. The important thing about contracts being a library is they are also fully debuggable, as we'll see in this example. So here I am in the debugger. You can see that the program is going to step. I'm just going to step through all the program calls. So we are first evaluating the preconditions before entering the method. And obviously, lines is not null. Let's give that guy around. And then we evaluate the second precondition. And then we're going to jump over to the program execution. So in this case, we have our little line that we picked. And then we're going to continue. Index is negative. Let's keep that guy around. And basically, we only have one element in the array, so we're going to jump out. And uh, I guess I didn't, oh. So let's see what, compare that to the string that Pex told us about. I guess I didn't copy the string correctly. I, I forgot the equals. Uh -huh. Okay, let's try again with the equals. So again, I'm going to step into the program and then go step by step into the execution. We are evaluating the preconditions, entering the method body, reevaluating line. Then now index is, is positive, great. We get the name, the name matches, and then we extract the results, and here we can see that uh, the result is empty. So now I've used an experience that I'm familiar with, which is debugging, to understand what the static checker was telling me. 
and I can actually debug as much as I need. This is a common uh, technique when you try to understand why a program crashes. You just run it enough time till you understand what's, what's happening. And now you also see what we were talking about earlier where the contract was understood declaratively, but our tools know how to do things the way you want them to. So for runtime checking, when you're doing debugging, you want to check the preconditions, execute the method body, and notice now that we hit the return statement, now we go check the post condition. And when the post condition fails, we get an exception, and we've even captured the string from the source code in that exception so that people are, you know, you're aware of exactly what the condition was that was failing. All right. Well, that shows how contracts work pretty well. It showed PEX coming up with some test cases. What's next? Well, Mike, in reality, people don't uh, read from hard-coded lists of strings. They usually use a file system or a database or something like that. Okay. So let's, let's, let's make it a little bit harder. And in this case, let's, let me scroll down. We're going to use the, the .NET APIs to read all the lines from a file. I'm going to pick a, a funny file name which doesn't exist on my machine. And um, read all lines. And that is a typical problem when you're doing testing that you have a dependency on an external uh, device or an environment like a database, file system, and it's usually hard-coded right into the program. And now the problem is dealing with that. So let's maybe try to build and see what's, what's happening here. Aha, the static checker is not happy. Yep. Let's see, what is the static checker complaining about? Oh, that's right. We have a, a precondition on parse lines now, and it doesn't know that the lines you read from the file are not null. That takes us back to the question, how much did we annotate the, the base class libraries? So in this case, the post condition just mentions that the result is not null. It doesn't tell us about the elements in the array. Uh, and in this case, what we're going to do is, is help the, the static checker by assuming that we actually have uh, all the elements not null. And now that we build, the static checker can use this information to, to prove. OK. Now the problem, if I try to run this, uh, the experience is not going to be good because I'm missing this file. And maybe you know, this file exists in environment, in the production environment, but on my test environment, I don't have it. So how do we deal with that, uh, with that in general in testing? And that's where uh, a framework that was built inside of PEX called Moles will help. So we, we've built a framework that allows to replace any .NET method with a delegate. It's, it's, uh, it's a detour implementation for .NET. There are many, uh, um, many implementation of such ideas for pretty much all platforms. So what do I mean by that? Let's, let's, uh, let's stop debugging. Let's create a test project and then, uh, and then isolate the test case. So first I'm going to use our Visual Studio integration to create a new test project and a new parameterized unit test for that method. So it's going in the background and creating a new project. And here we go. So we have, this was the original project. That's where we have our little reader. And this was created by PEX. It's a test project that uses the Visual Studio unit test framework. And in that project, you have what's called a parameterized unit test here. Let's zoom in. And it's really just a, it's really just a test. Um, it's really just a unit test that takes uh, parameters. And you can see those parameters are passed in into the implementation. So this is the entry point for the PEX exploration. OK. So now if you try to run PEX here, we'll get the same experience. We'll get a table. The only thing that's going to happen, PEX is going to generate a single test case because it doesn't understand the file system. So we need to isolate from that. OK. And in fact, it actually mentioned that you have a testability issue with the file readable lines. So PEX is really not happy about this. Um, and uh, let's apply the fix. All right. And now, why, now I can actually go and replace uh, the, file, uh, the file method. So file is a, 
is a type that exists in MS Corelib. It's sealed, so you can, cannot inherit from it. And also read all lines is a static method. That means in the .NET semantics, you cannot replace it. So in general, you would, you'd have lost the game here. But we've introduced a detour, so we can actually replace method at runtime, um, allowed to do that. So we're gonna use this special type that we've created for you. And this special type has a number of properties. For each method in file, there is a property that allows you to replace its implementation. So in this case, we're gonna replace it with a lambda expression that uh, returns maybe an empty array. Okay. And as you can see, everything is type safe and C Sharp is happy and compiles this. Um, so to understand what's happening, let's go and, and uh, debug the program. So I'm gonna I'm gonna build this and I'm gonna tell, let's see your specs, let's go back to the test and debug that first test case. I don't wanna debug it, okay. Let's try to run Plex now. I need at least one test case to, to be able to debug it. So let's just run it. So it's important to mention that Plex generate test case. Each time it finds interesting inputs, it actually saves it as source code in the test project. And you can see that here is the, here is the file where we've been editing and then we've created a subfile that contains all the code generated inputs. So if we go in there, we can see that we have a test case that's, that's pretty dull right now, but it actually uh, is actually was saved by, by PEC. So everything you see in the table, humanly readable, there's also a source, source version that actually can be picked up by your test framework, run in your build and so forth. So I'm gonna uh, start debugging this test. And here I'm just using the, the built-in debugger in, in Visual Studio. And what we're gonna see is how the the file API got replaced. So we, we enter the parameterized test, we set up the redirection, we enter the program on the test, and now when we step into read all lines, we're gonna enter read all lines and then take the shortcut to our custom method. Right, so here we are in our delegate. And if you look at the stack trace, things are a little bit clearer. Clear. So you have the program and then you enter the the implementation of read all lines, and then there is a shortcut that takes you out uh, to your custom implementation. So this framework called MOLS is very powerful um, to build all kinds of tools. In this case, we achieve isolation, but you could also think about fault injection, tracing, and all kinds of things based on that. And uh, the idea is very simple. You replace methods with, with something else. Okay, so it will run, and then, and then we, we hit the other issue. Okay, and then the, of course, the, the main idea is that once you've, once you replace the file API, then you can actually ask PEX to provide you with the content of the file. So in this case, we're gonna ask PEX to give us directly the files. I'm just gonna make sure, um, oops. The array is not null and then run PEX again. And what I, what I expect to see now, whoops, is that happy? I don't think we use an, this guy anymore. So let's run PEX again. Each time we run PEX, PEX will delete some test case, put new ones based on how your program change. And now PEX can actually understand what the file system means because it's a closed program. And the symbolic analysis can go through the file API and understand how you use it and in this case, generate the same, the same test case that you would have on the non-isolated part. So I, it turns out that isolation is pretty critical to apply a tool like PEX to realistic programs. All right, Mike. Yep. Should we do the refactoring or move on? Yeah, let's do the refactoring. All right, so another thing that programmers often do is they realize that code they've written should be made more general. I think that's pretty much what programmers do all the time. So we wrote this nice method parse, parse lines, and it's really maybe we could extract a general interface for parsing uh, lines from, from this array of strings. So we can use the .NET refactor uh, functionality to extract an interface uh, and create this interface method parse lines. 
And now the implementation that we saw is just one implementation of many implementations. And uh, we would really like. So how do I get all those contracts that exist in my implementation back into this interface? You can't put it directly on the interface method because in .NET, you're not allowed to put any method bodies on these methods. The interface method is restricted to being only that signature that you see on the screen. So we've come up with a way to encode this. Again, just like you saw that we had a particular encoding for talking about the return value of a method, we can talk about con interface contracts by creating a buddy class whose only purpose in its existence is to act as a container, a placeholder for those contracts. So you've seen that Pelly's defined a class called iReaderContract. That class will never be an implementation of this interface. It's there just to provide uh, a place that now we can stick the contracts. So why don't we go grab the contracts from our implementation and stick them in the contract class. So now we're leveraging the fact that contracts are inherited so that every implementation of this interface will inherit those contracts and will be held uh, accountable in particular for that post condition. Oh, I can see the squiggly is still there, although we've removed all the contracts. So it was picked up by the, by the definition, by the contracts that were in the interface. Okay. Very nice. All right. So that kind of uh, I think finishes this demo. And okay. we'll move to the next demo. So what you've seen uh, from the PEC side is test input generation based on dynamic symbolic execution. It's all based on runtime analysis. And we also have a built-in detours uh, framework that allows you to isolate uh, from any piece of code, which is very important for, uh, for let's say, realistic code base. And from code contracts, you've seen our library, uh, and you've seen how to use it both for runtime checking and static checking. And I hope you've seen a little bit of, give you an idea of how it's used for documentation generation. And in particular, you did see its use in the editor while in programming to be aware of the contracts. But that's kind of a sales pitch, and what we wanted to start on is a discussion with you about using these for teaching and research, because it seems more important that you be able to take these tools and the infrastructure back home with you and do something useful with it. Uh, but yeah, let's skip to all this. OK. So you want to tell them about how to teach with PECs? So, um, if you have access to Visual Studio, you can leverage uh, the great experience there, and you can use code contracts for correctness, and you can use PEX for, as a dynamic checker of code contracts. But we've also uh, built a web interface. Oops, actually there's a link here. We've built a web interface that allows you to run our tools uh, basically anywhere, from any device, when it's the web. Uh, what you see here is, uh, is our new website called PEX for Fun. It also does code contracts. And basically, um, this, this, uh, this text box contains C-sharp source code, and we always start from a puzzle method. And we're going to compile this code, we're going to apply the uh, code contract rewriter, and we're going to run it on our server. And we'll run PEX on it. So PEX will give you this input-output table. That means your students could come here, you give them the exercise you want, and then they're going to run the code, and then you'll get this table. So in this case, we have a little exercise. We, are, we want to implement a variation of the substring method, and um, we're obviously missing some contracts here. So why don't we do the exercise and... Let's see how it might be used, useful that way. When I, when I look at the failure here, obviously, it seems that uh, start should be in range. So let me go and, and write that start... Uh, be less than the, the length of the th string. And then what I can do is basically just run again. So you get the full experience, almost the full experience of Visual Studio, uh, but from a web, uh, web setting. OK. And so we're not done one yet. problem, how yes. now? Oh, so start is definitely not too big. <laughs> but it should be positive. Maybe it so. should be positive. That would help. So let's go and fix that negative. and run again. All right. Um, I guess start looks good, but the length, which is the second argument of substring, is, is still, still has issues. So length should be, the end should definitely be in range. And to speed up things, uh, we're going to also say that it should be greater or equal to the start. And uh, this should do the trick. All right. 
So we've generated a VEX generator table. Uh, it couldn't find any um, input that would uh, violate the preconditions. We didn't have any post conditions, but you could think about adding them. Now, what's in there for you if you want to use that as a teaching tool? There's a couple of things we've, we've done to, to make that happen. First, if you like this example and you think that's a good example you want to show your student, you can actually click on this permalink, this puzzle, and this creates a link that embeds uh, your puzzle. I mean, you can go copy this link, put it in a document or in a web page, and then tell your student to click on it. When they open their browser, they're going to be taken to your program. We do not store any data on our servers. Everything's encoded actually in the URL. The second thing that happens is we've, uh, so this is, this is funny, we've, uh, we've encoded the full history of attempts that the student has done to solve the puzzle in the page. So at any point in time, you can actually ask the student to copy this entire string and maybe uh, send it to you through email. Let me just open a word here. And this is the full history of attempts. So you can always click on one of the link and it takes you to that, that uh, intermediate program, right? So if you're wondering why a student has struggles, actually you have the full history of his attempt to solve the puzzle. The third thing you, you can do, which is even more fun, is you can turn your program, I'm going to delete this, into a, a dual. We call a dual um, another type of puzzle where you basically have to infer a secret uh, algorithm. So in this case, the student is given an empty program and he has to figure out what the secret program is doing. So he can do a trial and error exploration and PEX will tell the differences between his program and the secret program in terms of input and output. So maybe he's, you know, he's heard about substrings, so he's gonna, he has a hunch that's the thing. So he's gonna call it like this. But there's still some differences. So the program is still behaving in some cases the same, but not the same. And he can iterate like that. Uh, of course, you can give him hints. So we've, we've, we give multiple experiences based on this, on this uh, website uh, to be able to, uh, uh, easily apply our tools. You don't need Visual Studio. You don't need uh, to be running actually Windows to, to go and try uh, C Sharp, Visual Basic, or even F Sharp on, on this website. So that was for the teaching part, okay? And, uh, and we've, we, we've talked about that. Yeah, and we've already yeah. talked about hopefully how you could see to use code contracts to teach beginning programming, especially program verification. Uh, but one thing I wanted to switch and talk a little bit about is how to use the infrastructure we've built up possibly for your own research purposes. Uh, so all of our tools are built on top of CCI, which is the Common Compiler Infrastructure. It's an open source project that's been, we released from our group uh, several months ago. And it's, in general, it's a platform for supporting .NET compiler writers, meaning it supplies all of the common pieces that you use as you write a compiler. Um, what, in order to do that, it has to provide a rich API and infrastructure to give you an object model that's easy to manipulate. And that object model represents any possible .NET program. Right? So you can think about doing manipulations on, and analysis of .NET programs at a very nice high level of abstraction using the uh, CCI object model. In particular, one functionality that CCI comes with is a reader that takes any arbitrary binary um, so the .NET bytecode is called IL, and it will take any IL file and create the object model representation of it. And then there's a lot of support for doing very general visitor pattern type of programming against that object model. So here you see uh, part of a method that is navigating through a, a method definition, visits the method's return type and visits the parameters, goes on to probably visit the body. Um, but that model that the reader produces is this low-level model at the IL level. So the method bodies in particular are just sequences of bytecode instructions. And that's not as useful to manipulate as it would be if you decompile it and get to a level where you have method calls and the method calls have arguments and the arguments are general expressions. So of course, I mean, this is all in terms of a programmable object model and it's hard to show you on the screen. So I'm showing you a text dump of what, you know, of, of that level of, of abstraction. Uh, 
And the decompilation is definitely still a work in progress. So the rest of the infrastructure is quite mature. I would say that uh, we're still working intensively on the decompiler. Uh, so now we showed you in the demo earlier how contracts are encoded as method calls at the beginning of method bodies. That's all the decompiler gives you. It gives you this view of it that the first statement in this method body is a call to a method whose name is contract.requires, and it has a particular argument. Um, and that's not as useful as uh, to do the manipulations you probably want to do. You want to be able to separate the code model from the contract model and extract the contract. So this is a representation that there's a part of the infrastructure that allows you to, uh, to now separate them out and get the method body by itself and the contracts as their uh, little uh, abstract syntax trees. And then, of course, there's a whole other part of the infrastructure that takes the code model, lowers it back down to a metadata model, dumps it out to disk as IL, and now that IL is just a standard .NET binary that can be used for any of the other downstream tools or to execute or anything you want to do with it. Uh, and you already saw that, right? You saw the fact that we have a tool that takes those contracts and puts them in at the appropriate points for program execution so that when you execute that IL in the bottom right corner there, you saw the contracts being executed at the right points in time. Another interesting thing you could do would be just to stick the contracts back exactly where they were in the first place. So here, this is meant to say that we're going to put those, all those contracts back in as method calls at the beginning of the body. In other words, all we've done is round trip that IL and gotten back to the exact place we started with. Seems fairly useless, except that now you can write transforms at this nice high level model of the code model and the contract model to do manipulations. And then if you stick the contracts back into the binary, all of the other downstream tools just take advantage of it as if those contracts had been there and authored by the original person. So here's a little piece that indicates how to create a new post condition that says the return value of a method isn't null. Uh, in fact, why don't we go ahead and show that. So what we're going to open here is, yep, is actually the latest snapshot of the open source project that's on Codeplex. And it has a, a little sample called ensures not null, which does its injection of post conditions. So what you see in this program is it's a, it's a program where returns, never returns null, should never return null. And we're going to inject a POS condition there. That means when we're going to run this at runtime, it's going to fail. Now, of course, there's no POS condition right now. But if you run the code, we actually get a POS condition violation. So how did this happen? Well, we, we took the binary, we injected a POS condition, then the runtime rewriter went through that and turned that POS condition into a runtime check and then we actually uh, run the code. So how did you do that, Mike? All right, so there's a little framework. There's a framework that allows us to create arbitrary mutators, and they get called uh, at the time, that at, right after the assembly's been built. And so here is what you saw on the slide. Here's the uh, override for what happens when we visit a method definition. Uh, so the first thing is we decided that we only want to do this injection of the post condition if the method is visible outside the assembly. Now, maybe if you have a private method, you have a good reason for returning null. Uh, and of course, it doesn't make sense to do this transformation if, uh, if the method returns void or if its return type is, not a, a, a re is a value type. In other words, an integer or a character or something that uh, can't be null by definition. And then here's the part of the code that creates a new method contract with a new post condition and that post condition is the uh, inequality between uh, the return value that comes back from the method. And this is the representation of uh, null value of the appropriate type. Uh, and then down here, we can just say, well, if there are any existing contracts, we'll keep those. And no matter what happens, we'd like to store this as the new contract for that method. And then it's very simple using some of the infrastructure to just inject that into the assembly and, uh, and to write it back out. OK. So the points we've reached to today, we're trying to show you this contract library is now part of .NET 4.0. Uh, the tools are, have to be downloaded externally. That's from a, a website called uh, Dev Labs, which Visual Studio has set up to try out new technology that they're interested in. We've been there a little over a year. We've had lots of use. There's, 
uh, people writing book chapters as part of .NET books about code contracts. We've certainly published a lot of articles at different conferences about it. Uh, and it has a very active user forum on the DevLab site, so we encourage you to give us your feedback there. So it's, it's worth mentioning that we always have academic download that you get from the research site, but also professional developers can actually try out the tools, and that's usually the DevLab sites. But all the tools come with an academic license, typical MSRLA license. Okay, and of course, we really have done this work in conjunction with a lot of other great people, some of whom are here, and lots and lots of interns. So if you have students that are good, we really would love to have you send them to us for the summer. We promise we'll return them, uh, hopefully in better shape than you sent them over here. And now I'm happy to, uh, to invite Christoph to the stand. He's going to talk more about how we can use the PEX infrastructure to build cool tools and runtime analysis and so forth. Thanks. Uh, that's a great question. So the question was whether or not we could also support C and C++ because that would be really useful in, uh, in courses that, that focus on those languages for real-time systems and uh, other kinds of lower level code. Um, yeah, we currently, the code contracts is restricted just to uh, .NET languages. So if, if there's a managed compiler, then we can deal with it. I should mention that there's a related project from our group called VCC, which you can find on the RISE website that has a very similar system uh, specifically targeted at C. Oh. Yeah, we have a question. Yeah. Do you know if there are any uh, applications? Are, are there any applications? Uh, people can see an entire application that uh, uses contracts. Um, yeah, there's a there's a few in, there's a few internal. There's a few uh, applications internally uh, that have started to use it. I don't have any large scale applications that I could point you at that uh, extensively use it. Yeah, not yet. Um, we have gotten feedback on the forum that there are production environments out there that are using contracts and have claimed that you know it's an integral part of their build every day, but they haven't been able to share their code base with us, so I haven't seen the code myself. Uh, this is all very helpful, and and um, I look forward to this kind of thing getting out into the into the education infrastructure. But one of the things that I think uh, has to come first is uh, motivation for the students. If we walk into the classroom and start teaching this stuff, uh, the biggest problem is students turning off, and the, their their response to the comment "this is important" is "it's not important to me. I'm going to go work at Microsoft." And so one of the things I would, uh, I would desperately like you to do is to construct, if possible, um, related teaching materials that would discuss the importance of all of this to the normal operations and the everyday code building that goes on at Microsoft and the statistics on uh, what benefit you received and what happens when this actually gets used. If we had a way of uh, motivating students um, that would capture their attention. And the best way to do that is to say Microsoft does it. Uh, I think it would be an enormous win. Okay. Um, thank you. That's a great comment. So, I, uh, so code contracts is still very new. However, there's an existing system uh, for C and C++ code used inside of Microsoft that uses a different, completely different way of annotating the contracts, but does static analysis based on annotations. And that's uh, a requirement for uh, most product groups in Microsoft that they have to use those tools. So there's definitely, uh, uh, they definitely should not come to Microsoft and not expe and expect to get away without thinking about correctness. Uh, 
Yes, I know that, and uh, the, the work you describe is what I've had in my portfolio of weapons to motivate students. And there is some, uh, a limited amount of data on the value yeah. that that's been to the company. Uh, and that has provided a lot of benefit, but, but I just cannot emphasize too much how important it is mm. that there be a uh, substantial body of experimentation and statistics and you know, just blatant marketing of uh, this kind of technology so that uh, the undergraduate student doesn't have to accept it from me because they won't, but they will accept it from you. Great, thank you. Okay, all right, um, thank you very much. So I'm gonna talk more about the dynamic analysis part. So my name is Christoph Chalner. I'm from the University of Texas at Arlington. And we'd just like to quickly see a show of hands how many people know where Arlington, Texas is. Um, who has been there? All right, so a bunch of people. So for those who might not have been there or might not know where it is, it is in the Metroplex. It's right between Dallas and Fort Worth, uh, conveniently located at a major international airport, DFW, 20 minutes away from that. So it's very easy to come visit us, please do. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about joint work uh, with Nikolai Tillman from Microsoft Research, who was um, my mentor during my internship on the PEX team. He's the main PEX guy. Then also with Janis Markdakis, my PhD advisor, Ishtar Hussein, who is a PhD student at UTA, and Chen Kali, who is one of my colleagues at UTA. So I want to cover two um, topics. The first is dynamic symbolic execution, why I think it's great, um, how it works, and what kind of software engineering problems it might be useful for. And then also give you a couple of problems and solutions from my own experience. So dynamic symbolic execution has been pioneered by Patrice Godfroy, um, in the Dart tool and with his colleagues and also by Christian um, Kader and his colleagues at Stanford, roughly at the same time. And the high level idea is that uh, some dynamic symbolic execution is implemented in some um, execution engine, some analysis engine. And those solutions I'm gonna talk about, those tools are implemented as small clients on top of such an analysis engine. So here I have a few, um, three example um, tools that are implemented on top of an engine such as the PEX engine that we just heard about. Okay, so I wanna start with why I think that dynamic symbolic execution is a great thing. So I think it's great because it is a program analysis that is 100% sound. What do I mean by 100% sound? I mean that whenever the analysis says that some program P does X for some input I, that means that P will do X for I. That means that there are no such thing as false warnings. So there's never a case where the tool will claim that X is gonna happen for I, and then later turns out that this is actually not the case. And for people here who do not work in um, program analysis, that might be a little surprising, um, or obvious, depending on how you look at it. Um, but there are many analyses who suffer from that kind of problem of false warnings. So they will you know, say that the program will crash for some certain inputs, but then you as a user have to come and uh, look at the output and then do the reasoning again in your head and then decide for yourself if that actually can happen or not. And that will never happen to you with dynamic symbolic execution. And the nice thing is that this is even true for many of the constructs of programs that are often considered to be hairy in program analysis. For example, reflection, native code, dynamic dispatch, dynamic binding, and all these kind of more complicated things. So of course there has, been some, has to be some kind of drawback, and the drawback is that no analysis can be sound and complete. So in this case, we have a sound analysis that means it is not 100% complete. So what that means is there will be some input value i's, uh, input values i um, for which it will not do any analysis. But that is not um, that bad because there are certain analyses for which it's enough to reason just about some paths. And in software engineering, there are a couple of examples Probably the most well-known example is testing, where we only reason about some subset of inputs, and there are also other applications I'm gonna talk about in reverse engineering and the um, repair of data structures, and there are probably many more. Okay, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of how dynamic symbolic execution works. So the idea is to execute the program on some concrete input values. So we start with some default value, and here we have a program that takes uh, two integer values, so we just start with zero. We start executing concretely, but at the same time, we also execute symbolically. Uh, so we want to reason about also um, other values in 
the, those default values, so we introduce two symbolic variables. And I use red and bold here to um, denote the symbolic variables. So you start executing assign a minus one to C, like zero minus one. And the symbolic representation um, B is a variable, so all we can evaluate that to is the symbolic expression of B minus one. Continue executing side by side, we encounter a branch. In this case, minus one is less than zero, so we take the true branch and return zero, um, <coughs> execution terminates. In the symbolic representation, we also note the outcome of that, path, of that branch, which is B minus one is less than zero or B is less than one. And then we also remember this outcome in an execution tree. So now the execution is over and we're looking um, for other execution paths. So basically we want to force execution down some other branch. So we look in the tree for nodes um, that only have one child. That means there is uh, one child left that has not been uh, explored yet. In this case, we only have one, only one such node. So we invert that condition to force execution down some other path and get the condition of B is greater or equal to one. Then we go up to the root and collect all the conditions. In this case, there's only one. Um, and that will be the path condition. So the path condition just summarizes the condition it has to hold in order for execution to go down <coughs> some particular path. Then view some constraints over, solve this constraint system, and for that one there's many solutions, and for example, um, b is equal to five. And then we start over again. So again, execute concretely and symbolically side by side. This time c is four, c again is b minus one. This time we take the other branch because now c is greater or equal to zero. Again, note the outcome symbolically in the execution tree. The node's already added, so we don't do anything here. Continue to the next um, branch. We take the fourth branch because four is not zero. And the symbolic representation B is not one. So we again add the outcome to the execution tree. Do the same thing, uh, find a node that has had an unexplored child, invert that, solve the resulting constraint system, start over, and then until we either terminate or we run out of energy. So what we end up here is this execution tree, which summarizes the different paths that we have explored. And in this case, um, we actually explored the entire method. All um, paths are covered. So now, in this particular case, we have a, a sound and complete analysis of that piece of code. But in general, it's not going to be complete. In addition to that tree, we also have for each path one representative input or test case. So it was the high level overview of dynamic symbolic execution. And the magic is that the analysis only reports things that are just observed. So that's how it is able to be 100% sound. After this quick overview, I'm gonna talk about a few example analyses. I'm gonna start with DICE, which stands for Dynamic Symbolic Execution for Dynamic Invariant Inference. So what is Dynamic Invariant Inference? It is a reverse engineering technique. What's reverse engineering? So typically in software engineering, we start with some high level specification like invariance, pre and post conditions, and then some kind of a forward engineering takes place. We arrive at source code. But in other situations, we just have the code. Um, maybe we lost the specification or we never had it, and then we want to do some kind of reverse engineering to recover original specifications. Now in dynamic invariant inference, we want to do this under um, a few test executions. And that is good for several soft engineering tasks, like for example, um, program understanding or inferring summaries of code for other analyses as input. And I want to focus here on that the key aspect is to uh, generalize existing executions. Because we might have just a few um, executions, like for example, that for um, feeding one into some program, we get back three, or for feeding 50, we get 24. And just summarizing that is not very interesting. So we want to get more than just this one maps to three and 50 maps to 24. We want to generalize to things that we have not seen or are not in that existing test um, set. So more interesting precondition would be that P is larger than zero. So the best known work 
um, in dynamic invariant inference is uh, the Daikon work by Michael Ernst and others. And um, that approach to dynamic invariant inference is to start out with a set of predefined template invariants and then um, observing execution, um, seeing all these values that occur during execution and then try to fit those values uh, to those predefined um, templates. For example, at method entry, the parameter values are in scope, so we can try to fit those values to the templates. And if those um, templates have held a few times and were never invalidated, then we can just propose that those are probably the invariants that were intended at this location. So to summarize, it is kind of a gray box approach because you only look at the values that occur during execution. Now, in our work, um, we would also like to take the source code into account. And the high level um, idea here is that those symbolic expressions that we are building during dynamic symbolic execution are exactly the kind of expressions that we're looking for in dynamic invariant inference. For example, those path conditions that we built were exactly the conditions that have to hold in order for some values to reach a certain part of code. That's exactly what we can think of as a precondition. So here I have an example program that does something at the beginning and then throws an argument exception if some condition holds. And that looks very much like the programmer wanted to check a precondition. So if you do dynamic symbolic execution on that and start with values two and five for X and Y, then we do the concrete and symbolic execution side by side. This time we do not um, exit with uh, argument exception, so we reach the main part of the code. Take the first if condition, um, execute, and also note that dynamic symbolic execution builds a complex symbolic expression for the return value, like at the far right corner there. And we also built the execution tree. Now we try uh, a second test case that again sidesteps this um, precondition check, takes another branch and builds some other complex expression for the return value. So what we end up with are these complex expressions for the return value and the um, execution tree. <coughs> Now, if we look at the disjunction of those path conditions, that exactly looks like the precondition of the code. Like in this case, we can derive from that execution tree x times y is greater or equal to zero. And that looks exactly like the precondition that the programmer probably had in mind. <coughs> and similarly, those complex expressions we built for the return value might be just the post condition that the program had in mind. Okay, so we evaluated this on a small, um, we have a small case study, which is um, that uh, benchmark that comes with DICON is called Stack R. It's a stack data structure implemented with an array. And we hand inferred a set of invariants we think are the, probably the ideal invariants for this. Um, ran both DICE and DICON on those and both inferred close to all the ideal invariants. But um, compared with DICE, uh, the DICON tool inferred many more additional ones which are likely invariants, but you could also consider those as maybe redundant or spurious or maybe even wrong. So here's an example invariant that Daikon inferred, which um, talks about, so top of stack is an index into the stack. Then if that value is larger or equal to zero, that implies that if you right shift that value by some <coughs> default value, then it gets zero. And that is probably redundant or maybe even a wrong invariant. And Dicey would not just guess these things. It would it just um, gonna infer things from the code. Okay, a uh, second um, example application of dynamic symbolic execution is for data structure repair. So the motivation of data structure repair is that pretty much all of software is built on top of some um, data structures. And at runtime, these data structures can get corrupted. So that might be due to many factors like um, some software bugs that are <coughs> occur only in very rare cases or some hardware bugs or even some particles from space that hit a transistor and then flip a bit and just corrupt the data structure. So such a corruption might crash uh, the software. And now there are cases where we don't have the time to restart the system or even analyze a problem and you know um, fix the code and reinstall and all these things. For example, in real-time systems that we just don't have the time. So instead, what we want to do is um, to repair the data structure automatically. And the idea here is 
that there is some correctness condition and we want to bring the data structure automatically back into a state that satisfies that correctness condition. In addition, we also want to do that quickly because we don't have forever to do that. So clearly the approach hinges on those correctness conditions because if that's wrong, then um, we will just repair it to a wrong state. So we assume that the correctness condition is correct, but on the positive side, the correctness condition is much smaller than the entire program. So assuming that that's correct is easier than assuming that the entire program is correct. And also uh, in recent approaches, we can express the correctness condition in the same programming language as the program. So um, that also makes it easier for the programmer to reason about correctness conditions. So the best known prior work in this area is called Juicy. Um, and I shouldn't say best known, but the um, uh, well-known prior work is called Juicy, which takes, um, is able to express correctness conditions in the programming language, in Java here, in this case. And here is an example of how Juicy works. So we have a linked list data structure here. Um, and the correctness condition is called uh, the REPOK method. And in this particular linked list data structure, the value of the first node is supposed to be the length of uh, the linked list. So in this case, we have a corrupt data structure because we have four here, but we only have three nodes. So the correctness condition works by first reading out this length value and saving it into a local variable. And that, so that's the first field access here. And then iterating over the next field and visiting the nodes calculating the length, in the end comparing the length with that value we stored in the local, um, local variable. And then the assumption is that most likely the corruption is with the last field access. So the tool will um, just um, try to systematically change the value of the last field that was accessed, which is the next field of the last node. So the first attempt here is to change it from null to point to the first node run REPOC here again and then notice that this actually did not repair the data structure. So systematically try other values and none of these actually repairs the data structure. So then we need to backtrack in the list of field accesses to the third one and to the second one and uh, until we finally find that the corruption was with the first field access. So what we um, do it instead is use dynamic symbolic execution to solve the problem. So execute this REPOC method symbolically collect path conditions as we go. And then finally, when we return, uh, reach that return for statement, invert the last constraint and solve the resulting constraint system and use that solution to repair the data structure. So um, from that, you can see that, I mean, we model the entire um, state of the data structure symbolically, like the reference fields and the primitive fields and are thereby able to use a constraint solver to get a solution back. So, and in this case, we don't suffer from this um, backtracking search at least, least exponential behavior. So the, for this single link, link, linked list, um, here's um, some preliminary results where we have on the y-axis the repair time, so lower is better, and the red line is a juicy line, and that um, you get that exponential behavior that I was talking about. So at some point, our overhead of using dynamic symbolic execution is paying off because we don't need that backtracking search. Okay, so a final um, application I would like to quickly talk about is then database application testing. So in database application testing, what you often have is um, you have some very large old uh, existing databases that are very valuable for companies uh, like you know um, customer database, um, claims up, uh, database in insurance companies, et cetera. And then um, th there's a need to write new applications against those databases. And clearly the new applications have to work very well with those existing databases because the databases are where the value is. So those databases are large and they're relatively static and almost append only. So that means that they just add new information to those databases. And as any applications, these applications have a very large number of execution paths. Um, but the insight here is that not all of those paths are equally interesting. So what we want to do is we want to focus on those paths that can be triggered by the data that is in the database. So you have an example. 
there's a database, there's a very small program that issues queries against the database. And uh, so the thing here to notice is that the user has a way to influence those queries because the user just wants to select a particular customer or a particular claim from the database. So the user has a value to constrain the queries or the user defined queries. So the application issues that query, some value comes back, the value X here, and then that value that comes from the database is flowing through the program. So it might be passed to some method and then you know, assigned to some other variables and then ultimately might end up being used in branching conditions. So from that it becomes clear that different values from the database um, lead to different paths being covered in the program. Or you know, in other words, that if we issue different queries to the database, different paths will be covered in the application. So clearly what we wanna do here is to systematically generate different queries. So there is lots of, uh, lots of prior work in this area, not by us, by other people. Um, I didn't put any names here, but there, there's lots of prior work. Um, and much of this is on generating mock databases. So what um, people do is they um, collect um, constraints from the program and then solve those constraints to generate small databases that will force execution down many paths. Now the big problem here is that who knows if those generated databases are actually representative of the real database. So how serious will the user take those generated mock databases? Because um, those big databases they can be very complex and there might be very subtle patterns in there. Um, so that's a kind of a hard problem. So what we do is we propose to sidestep this entire generation problem and instead use dynamic simple execution to um, collect path conditions, invert nodes, and use those as candidate queries. So map the path conditions to queries. <coughs> and then we have some ways to pick different candidate queries, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, as I said, this joint work, what I um, talked about, DICE is uh, appeared in ICSI with Nicola and Yanis. Um, the repair work appeared as an emerging result in ICSI 2010 with Ishtiak. And the um, database testing is joint with Chenkai, who has just appeared in a workshop. With that, we can take questions. I don't have a mic. Well, thanks to all the speakers. Let's give them a round of applause.